This is a Wisdom from the Guides episode. top of world headquarters of southeastern fly this is the southeastern fly podcast thanks for joining us for this episode feel free to share with your friends and fishing partners subscribe or follow so you'll be the first to know when an episode drops if you find value in the podcast drop by the southeastern fly store explore the merch that pays for the southeastern fly podcast also if you need additional information about fly fishing techniques flies fly tying gear remember the fly fishing coaching sessions are open and there are time slots that are available or becoming available that's live video coaching it's best for new and intermediate anglers students are producing better results for themselves so who are our guests today on this wisdom from the guides episode first guest grew up fishing and hunting in the blue ridge mountains in a rolling piedmont of his native central virginia he's fished the roadless latitudes of canada spring creeks and big rivers of the west carp flats of the Great Lakes, mangrove forests of South Florida. Currently, he guides in Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee. You can fan, find him at mattreillyflyfishing.com. Please welcome to the podcast, Matt Riley. Matt, thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for having me, David. Good to be here. Matt, we can't have a wisdom from the guides episode if we only have two guides. So I've invited another friend of mine and soon to be a friend of yours as well. Uh, y'all had a little bit of time to talk before the episode. So our second guest grew up in middle slash eastern Tennessee. Uh, he fishes all over the altitudes of Tennessee from high in the Smokies to down in the valleys. He's very knowledgeable about fly fishing in the West. He currently guides in middle Tennessee, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and small streams of the Cumberland Plateau. You'll find him at Trout Zone Anglers. Let's welcome back to a Wisdom from the Guides episode, David Knapp. David, good to see you again. Good to see you, and thanks for having me on here. I always enjoy it. Yes, sir. David is sitting in Cades Cove right on the road. Uh, actually, he's got a background that uh, is a picture of Cades Cove. So Matt is in his, he said he's in his backyard. It looks like, it honestly looks like one of the sheds from Louisiana, like the dock sheds down there. I just knew you were going to say you were down there, which was going to hurt my feelings. So <laughs> I wish right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's going to be a little warmer down in Louisiana than it's going to be here or there. Uh, this coming weekend it's supposed to get down in the teens here so that ha that has some definitely has some benefits to it but it also is cold on the bones this particular episode originated from our podcast by southeastern fly facebook group members they have a strong desire to learn more about smallmouth fishing on the fly so we want to take this episode from the larger waters to the smaller streams uh, and give kind of a little bit of variety so matt fishes you fish from a, a, a boat, a raft, is that right? Yes. And then David is a wading angler for smallmouth up on the plateau. So we're coming at it from two different perspectives. We want to get a big water perspective and a small stream wading perspective. I've already been a guest and put an episode out on smallmouth. Usually I'll answer some of the questions too, but I, if the, the listener hasn't heard the smallmouth episode, it dropped in December, I believe. I had done an episode on the Wet Fly Swing podcast uh, and, and Dave was kind enough to say, hey, why don't you put this episode out in your, in your feed? Uh, so I did that. So I'm probably not going to answer any questions here, but I will interject. If I, if I hear something really cool, I'm going to poke around on it. Uh, I hope to hit as many of the or anticipate as many questions as I can to make the episode really good because we have some excellent feedback on the smallmouth episodes. So you two are sitting in a good spot to drop information. And I've done my research with Matt and I've done some research on David too, personal research with David and fish with David quite a bit. But these are two fishy guys. They uh, they know how to catch fish. They know how to catch smallmouth. Uh, so I think we're all going to learn something here. So let's roll right into the first question. Y'all want to go ahead and get on with it? Yes, sir. So Matt, what equipment do you prefer when fishing for smallmouth i am a i'm a seven weight guy so to start with the rods 90 percent of the time i fish a seven weight a nine foot seven weight rod i occasionally carry an eight weight 
especially for if in the very few situations where I feel the need to throw a sinking line or a bigger, you know, if it's a five plus inch fly that just will handle better on an eight weight. And again, that's, that's maybe five to 10% of the time that I'm fishing in the spring to fall time frame. So seven and eight weights, you know, a six weight will do pretty well, um, especially if you're fishing, you know, floating lines and top water stuff. But so a seven weight to me is a really sort of even middle of the road. And that's what I personally throw most of the time. And then from the perspective of lines, I'm a big proponent, you know, like you said, David, I mean, you can be really simple about it um, or you could be as complex as you want to. On all the waters that I fish, you can get by all year, generally speaking, fishing a floating line. And I say that, you know, with the idea, you know, when you do need to be in the lower part of the water column certain times of the year, if you fish a floating line with a nine foot fluorocarbon leader or, you know, maybe 10, 11 feet, if you really need it, you know, you can effectively fish with a weighted fly down to, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 feet. If you, if you need to, that said, once you get into the realm of fishing streamers, particularly non-weighted streamers, streamers that might need some density and weight in the line to get them down. I also fish intermediate lines and I also think fish uh, sink tip lines. The sink tips, again, 5% of the time that I'm fishing, but particularly in colder water, sometimes a foot um, in depth makes a big difference. And if you can keep your fly fishing, you know, a foot above the bottom, two feet above the bottom versus, you know, trying to fight with a floating line to keep it down in the water column. Because every time you make a strip, it pulls the fly another, you know, six inches up in the water column. I think that that sinking line does make a difference sometimes. Um, and then, like I said, some flies like uh, the Murdich minnows, one that I fish a lot comes to mind quickly. You know, you can fish it with a floating line, but uh, they don't sink very well. And you don't need them to sink much, but you want them to be, you know, six inches to a foot, maybe under the water. And I think an intermediate does that really well. I fish the spectrum on mines. And then when it comes to leaders, you know, it's, it's again, it's just situational. If I'm fishing top water stuff, I fish, uh, you know, I generally start with a nine foot tapered leader. The lightest line that I typically fish would be 10 pound or, you know, one X or so. Um, I typically fish zero X or 12 pound when we've got low clear water. And then anytime fishing top water stuff that I want to stay on the surface, I start with a nine foot mono or nylon leader because it floats. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do there is I'll cut maybe a foot of the tippet off of that and i'll tie on a foot to 18 inches of fluorocarbon tippet fluorocarbon has a higher abrasion resistance for fish that take your fly and and bulldog you and drag you under ledges and logs <laughs> and stuff like that um, which inevitably happens and it makes a good story too it does i i can't i can't tell you i can't tell you how many times i've i've jumped out of the boat you know in the summer to and have to, you know, dig a fish out from underneath of a ledge, you know, <laughs> on the, on the river. And, and then on top of that, what the fluorocarbon tip it does is it, it sinks just slightly below the surface. I'm sure guys might do this dry fly fishing for trout too, to some degree, but it, it sort of eliminates that little bit of a dimple that floating tip it creates when it's sitting in the film. And so on a really technical, like high sun, clear water, low water day, when you have a five pound fish staring at your bug for 10 seconds before he eats it, I think that that might make a difference over the course of, of a season um, because that little dimple, you know, can have light refracting through it, just makes that tip it all the more visible. And then anything sinking, um, sinking fly lines, uh, I'll use a shorter four to maybe six foot piece of, uh, you know, just level 12, 16 pound tippet fluorocarbon. And then, uh, you know, for anything fishing straight on the bottom, like with dumbbell eyes or something, it's going to be fluorocarbon as well. Just so you don't have the buoyancy of mono or nylon fighting your fly, you know, as it's trying to sink. That kind of gives you a little bit more control too, or it does seems to for me. I mean, it's not like I'm down there directing the fly but it does give you a little more control over you know especially if you're fishing the bottom with like a, a crawfish pattern and you're trying to mm -hmm. bump it and raise it and you mean with a you mean with a floating line uh with a sinking line oh yeah on the bottom yeah yeah it sounds like you fish similar to what we what i try to do is 
you know, make that line match the water depth and mm-hmm. take into account speed, weight of the fly, what should my retrieve be? Those kinds of things start coming into play. And- I will say that um, maybe to be a contrarian, that I, I fish, I fish crayfish flies with the floating line like 95% of the time. And my, I get asked that question a lot, you know, how do you fish a, a crayfish fly? And my biggest reason for the floating line is, you know, even, even with, you know, like an intermediate line has generally has a, some sort of mono core or something like that, that allows you to have a lot more sensitivity, a lot like, you know, guys fishing, fishing fluorocarbon on spinning reels or something like that. Yeah, it makes sense. I generally feel when you're fishing crayfish flies, sometimes the takes can be so subtle that I think just the water tension on a fly line that is subsurface period makes it really hard to feel any kind of take. So I'm much more of a, like I said, what I'll do is tie a crayfish fly on a nine foot fluorocarbon leader down to 12 or 16 pound crayfish fly has got to have some kind of weight in it and I'll cast the fly and you know let the fly sink and usually what I do is I throw some sort of a little kind of crooked mend into the fly line so there's so the line's not perfectly straight if you create some sort of angle in your fly line that allows you to see anytime that crayfish fly stops so if it catches a rock or something like that, you know what that looks like. It usually is kind of just like a slow, you know, the line will start to kind of peel towards it. In which case you can just do a short little strip or you can give a mend or something like that. And that floating line being tied to the surface, it'll kind of hop the fly up, Mm -hmm. you know, six inches or so, and then it'll sink back down. Or, you know, you might see a a sharp little twitch. um, And in which case, you know, it's a lot like fishing uh, soft plastics or something on on a, you know, sort of a slack line presentation where you see that twitch and you can, you know, you can build ansom because you got the floating line and (laughs) and no water, no water tension. So (laughs) that's that's actually how I do that. So weirdly enough, if I'm fishing a crayfish fly, I'm fishing a floating line. If I'm fishing some sort of neutrally buoyant or deer hair bucktail kind of streamer then i'll fish it sink it you mentioned them a, a minnow a while ago and i'm sorry i didn't i wrote it down i thought you said a merch merch Mer- merch mineral or something like that yeah murdich murdich how do you spell that uh it's m-u-r-d-i-c-h okay just for the listener out there to be able to to uh, look that up i think that's important to to be able to give that is that is that one that's got a deer hair or is it buoyant or is it so it's it's only buoyant because it doesn't have any weight in it and then it has it does have bucktail it has a synthetic material i, I believe it's called ice fur mm-hmm. or um, it's very similar to the cct body wrap or chocolates, uh, body wrap, that kind of stuff. It's kind of a crinkly yeah. EP, EP fiber kind of, kind of feel. And so it traps a lot of air and then there's no weight in it. You know, I do know guys that fish them with, you know, like a split shot or something on their tippet, which works. But if you're going to fish a fly, I think that doesn't have any weight built into it. The benefit of that is you have this excellent neutrally buoyant action where you can give it a hard strip and it can kick and kind of flutter. And right. when you start adding weight to the fly itself or to the leader, you know, you kind of rob your your presentation of that a little bit. And so fishing it on a line that gets it down I think is is a better way to go. Yeah, I agree with that. That's kind of like fishing. Um, one of my favorite flies is uh, oh a zoo cougar. Sheesh! Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Like, I should know that. That yeah. is one of your favorite flies. Yeah, you're supposed yeah. to know. <laughs> <laughs> Brought you one that you'd hung. One of your clients had hung in a tree the last time we fished. Yes. I'd found. I had it in my truck like for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that was uh, wow. That was in depth. I like that. There's a lot of lot to absorb there. This may be one of those episodes that that folks want to listen to more than once, or parts of more than once. If they're gonna, if they really want to get serious about smallmouth, you know, be able to take these different questions and and lay them out and kind of use whatever they can from the episode, this episode, and put it in their program because probably nobody will use all of all of one, all of the other, or all of both. But you know, what what pieces can I put in my in my process to help me along? So let's move to David. And David, you're going to take a to look at the same question. What equipment do you prefer when fishing for smallies? And, and uh, but you're going to look at it from uh, smaller streams like the, the Cumberland Plateau. There's a lot of small streams up there and there's some some small streams that feed into 
a little bit bigger streams and there's some pretty decent sized rivers up there as well. So up there, most of what you do is wading. Is that right? Yeah. Here on the plateau, for sure. You know, some of the rivers like on the Highland Rim, kind of towards Nashville, but a little off the plateau. And then also East Tennessee, like for looking at, you know, the pigeon system or the little rivers, lower Abrams Creek, some of that stuff. Some of those places you can get a boat in, especially if you have a raft or something, but the vast majority of the stuff I fish is, is small enough that the only time you're going to get a boat down, it may be in the spring when the water's up or, or something. And then it better be a pretty good boat because there's, there's some pretty big water on some of those creeks that I fish. So if we're looking at it from the wading, a wading perspective, let's start with rod choices and do the same thing. Go through fly lines and leader sizes and leader length and tippet sizes. Then we'll, let's talk about some flies as well. A lot of what Matt was fishing, I think, is going to apply for the same types of streams that I fished. The only only real difference is everything's going to get downsized, which you would kind of expect for fishing small streams. Um, and some of that comes into personal preference too. I'll go, I'll go all the way down to a four weight sometime fishing some of these streams with the understanding that you may still encounter an 18 or 20 inch fish. And uh, you know, an 18 or 20 inch fish on a four weight can be can be a challenge. I think the the biggest reason that I often go down to those really light rods. And I'd say more than anything, I probably fish a five or a six. And so I'm not saying I always fish four weights, but I do sometimes fish them. But these creeks here, particularly on the plateau, this doesn't really apply as much to East Tennessee smallmouth streams. It would apply to some of the Highland Rim smallmouth streams though also. They get really big in the cold months and they get really low in the summer. And when I say really low, some of the creeks I fish get down to five or 10 cubic feet per second. And, you know, you're basically fishing little small ponds or pools, if you will, in between sections that part of the year would be great riffle water, but, you know, just a trickle in the, in the heat of the summer. And those fish get pretty, pretty spooky in that kind of water a lot of the time. So um, I'm using those light rods as much for the soft landing of the fly line as, as anything. And I'm kind of, I'm a trout guy first, um, small mouth guy, second type of angler. And well, David, you know this. I love finesse fishing. I love midge fishing. I love I love going small when I can. So a lot of times I'm I'm throwing small foam stuff. I'm throwing hoppers, small poppers that most people would would be using for bluegill or something. And and again, a big piece of that is these fish just kind of get spooky on the plateau. I've had a lot of fish that will come up and kind of just stare at a a bug and then, you know, either the tip is too big or, or, you know, I didn't twitch the bug right or something. And they're kind of like, eh, no. And, you know, you go down smaller on the bug or lighter on the tippet and the next cast they eat. So I'd say when the flows are up a little bit, I'm fishing five and six weights and I'm probably trying to fish. Uh, I'm kind of with Matt. I like going as heavy as I can. So as, as long as I can, I'm fishing probably one X more than anything, but I will in the in the heat of summer, I will occasionally when I'm hopper fishing go all the way down to four X on some of these creeks up here. And it's not necessarily because I want to, it's just <laughs> when the fish are getting real finicky on me, sometimes that's where we end up, but that's kind of a last resort. I carry that stuff with me. And even when I think it's going to be a tough day, I'm usually still starting on one X or two X because you guys both know well enough when Matt was talking about digging them out from under ledges, you get you get four X and that fish digs under something, you're done. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. And smallmouth are guaranteed going to dig. There was a, there was a time I was fishing this, you know, talking about rods, I was fishing a little seven and a half foot four weight glass rod that I had got for trout. And I was like, I want to see what I can do with smallmouth on this rod. So I was fishing on one of the little creeks up here and hooked, I don't know, a 10 inch smallmouth. It was, you know, just a little fish. And I couldn't do anything with that fish. I mean, he was, he was going under every rock he wanted to go under and I, and I had heavy tippet on him. I mean, it's just nothing I could do with that fish. So when I do fish a four weight or something, I'm um, even five weights, I'm fishing really fast rods. I'm fishing rods that even though they're a four weight or a five weight, I can still really have that strength in the butt to really stick it to a fish. Cause you are going to have to haul those fish out of structure. And it usually goes better if you can haul them out before they get in the structure. Once they dig in there, all bets are off. There's a lot that can happen. Um, as far as fly lines, it was interesting. Cause I kind of, I was kind of expecting Matt to be like, Oh yeah, we like sinking lines out of the boat and stuff. And it, you know, it turns out we're, we're fishing the same way, big water, small water, small mouth is a small mouth. I'm 95% of the time fishing floating lines. I'd say the, the one exception when I'm wade fishing would be some of those more lowland rivers. Again, the pigeon system, like the little pigeon, um, little river, some of the Highland rim streams over towards Nashville. If we're looking early in the season when the flows are up, um, and the um, water has some turbidity in it. <laughs> That's an inside joke. 
Matt. That's a, that came from a long time back on one of the episodes we did. <laughs> Anytime I'm fishing streamers in that kind of a scenario, I, I like to at least have a rod with a sinking uh, sink tip line, maybe not a full sink, but a sink tip line just to get down. And again, a lot of that's just the type of flies I might be fishing. If I'm fishing like a sculpin or something, I usually prefer something with neutral buoyancy instead of something with a lot of weight. Even then, most of the time, I still don't really feel like I need the sinking line. I, again, there's some rare instances so here on the plateau. Sometimes in the cold months, I mean, I've caught smallmouth here on the plateau in the middle of February when it's not even on most people's radar. And, and it's just because we had a warm spell. We had a warm rain. The water came up 400 CFS water hit 50 degrees and all of a sudden if you could get that fly down about three feet in the water column and fish a minnow you know or a, a a jig style fly or something with some action and you can catch a lot of smallmouth that time of year because they're they're just like anything you know the water warms up there it's not that they're not eating in the winter they still need to eat it's just they may not eat as often there's not as much food available so they get that opportunity where the water warms up and some baits moving around or they're just their metabolism's kicked up a little bit they're going to eat anything they can find and no one's no one's fishing them that time. So when you do find them and the day is right and you, you know, you kind of all those stars align, you can actually catch some really nice fish that time of year. And I'd say that time of year, more than anything, when it's kind of cooler out is when I'm more likely to fish in some sinking lines. Leader sizes, again, pretty similar to what Matt was talking about. I'm mostly fishing nine foot. Although again, when the water's getting real clear and those fish are spooky, I'll sometimes start extending those out, um, maybe add some tippet. And uh, even then I'm usually not going more than 10 or 12 feet if I can get away with it. And it's pretty rare that I can't, I'd, I'd say smallmouth. I make them probably sound more picky than they really are. They, they tend to be fairly tolerant. I would say here on the plateau. And I already kind of alluded to some of those tippet sizes. I'm mostly, you know, trying to stay in that eight to 10 pound range if I can, but I have been known to go all the way down to probably about six in, in some circumstances. Uh, let's see what else flies. You wanted to know maybe some flies also to go with that system. Um, yeah. any kind of fishing you do, you want to want to match the, the fly to the, whatever food source is available. And here on the plateau, so um, same thing in a lot of the East Tennessee streams, crawdads are huge. So I like to fish a lot of crawdads or, or flies that might maybe be taken as a crawdad here on the plateau. We like to fish tequilis, same thing, you know, just something with some weight that can get down near the bottom and then bounce it. You'll throw into a hole that looks bottomless and you just kind of watch that fly sink out of sight. It's kind of what Matt was talking about. You watch the end of your line where that fly line is getting kind of close to the leader and you just wait for the twitch, man. And that twitch happens and you you give it the, the old bill dance that he talked about and, <laughs> and you know, you never know if it's going to be a little tiny guy or if it's going to be a big old fish. Cause there, there are some good fish. I would say I do that when I need to, uh, those subsurface type type presentations. And again, if I'm fishing um, bait fish or something like that, just because these fish don't tend to be real picky and the bait tends to be pretty small. I mean, we're talking, you know, baby bass fry that might be an inch and a half long or two inches long, maybe baby bluegill fry that are three quarters of an inch long, really small stuff. So I'll fish clousers and stuff, but again, it's, it's all scaled to the size of the water. And a lot of times when I say clouser, like I tie some little clousers on like a short shanks, number six hook or something, you know, maybe even a number eight with some pretty small dumbbell eyes. Cause I really don't want it sinking fast. Cause on, you know, five cubic feet per second, if it sinks fast, you're done. You're having to rip that fly. And these fish take more time to to look at the fly than I always feel like they ought to. And sometimes if you can slow that retrieve down by keeping not, not too much weight in your fly, you can kind of suspend that fly a little bit and twitch it, suspend it, twitch it, suspend it. It gives them a little more time to think about it. And usually they'll kind of work themselves up to it, you know, but you know, a little clouser and sometimes if the water's up bigger clousers, of course, um, there's a lot of dragonflies and damselflies up here. And I love fishing, fishing around grass lines and stuff where they're looking for those nymphs. So like, you know, Carter's rubber leg dragon or something like that. But that's all for me, all those flies are all secondary, like crawdads, bait fish, like all that stuff is like as necessary. I always have it with me, but if I could have just one fly to fish for smallmouth, it'd probably be a black stealth bomber, maybe a black popper. I just, oh. for me, smallmouth fishing, it's the same thing with brook trout. It's, it's like, it's meant to be a surface experience if oh, at all yeah. possible and that's that's my preferred way to do it it's not every day that we get to do that but i try to time my own personal fishing trips for smallmouth to coincide with those warm <laughs> summer months you know schedule a day off three months in advance or something yeah. and then go take a you know box of five stealth bombers and 
my five weight and go fish for smallmouth on the surface. Yeah, mine is definitely poppers. I love it when they come and eat a popper or something like it's that. Amazing. It's amazing. It's nothing it, like it. I would rather do that than just about anything. You know, the one thing I didn't hear either one of you mention, and and, and let's just let's just talk through this piece. Do y'all uh, a, a tequili is is similar to a big nymph a lot of in a lot of situations, but do y'all nymph any? I know a lot of folks want to know about nymphing for smallies. So I I've had people ask me that question, and I it's weird you can get kind of technical about it. I mean, I would consider any crayfish fly to still be a streamer, mm-hmm. but I will dead drift them and fish them, mm-hmm. you know, like a nymph. Mm-hmm. But if, if you want to talk about actual, and, and I mean, another technical way you could take it is, you know, a helgramite is a larva mm-hmm. of a Dobson fly. So is fishing a helgramite fly nymphing or is it streamer fishing, you know? But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would not say that I ever nymph fish for smallmouth. A big, a big point of mine on that is just the idea that uh, outside of like what David was saying with dragonfly or damselfly, you know, nymphs, most of your adult, you know, larger smallmouth, while they will eat smaller bugs, you know, the majority of their diet is going to be crayfish and bait fish and wow. larger insects, you know, cicadas, June bugs, dragonflies, etc. So I wouldn't say that I ever nymph for smallmouth. And I, w- I would agree with that myself as well. I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to put nymphing in a category of a technique, yeah, I, you know, it's kind of what Matt was saying. <laughs> I'll, I'll fish them the style of nymphing all dead drift stuff. And again, it's that, you know, those crawdads, tequilies, stuff like that. But the only nymphs that I really fish with, with, you know, which would be like a, a dragonfly nymph or something, I don't fish them, you know, under a bob or dead drift. They're, they're always actively fished, often sight fish. Or it's when I'm getting really picky fish kind of cruising grass lines and stuff and I need to get its attention, but so, with something really subtle and it's always fishing it more like a streamer really than a nymph. You know, I might be, I'm stripping it, maybe not as fast as a, a, a bait fish pattern. I'm crawling it more than, than stripping hard. But um, I, if we're talking about it as a technique, I would say I do nymph just to the extent, yeah, I'll sometimes slap a, you know, slap a bobber on there with a, a crawdad and, and dead drift it through a deep hole or um, on the, on the rare occasion, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be chasing smallmouth out of the boat, which I don't do a whole lot. But when I do, you know, same thing, put a crawdad on and a, a thing with a bobber or something like that and, and dead drift him. But so as a technique, yes, but not, I'm not really fishing nymphs per se for, for smallmouth myself. And, and again, like, like you were saying, David, I, I know people talk about it all the time and I know certain times a year they maybe they're eating them some but you know i'm always kind of at the mindset when i'm smallmouth fishing I'm, I'm either a fishing on the surface and if i'm fishing a full weight with hoppers i'll, I'll go catch 10 inch smallmouth all day and be happy just because that's fun you know right. if, if i'm if i'm fishing big poppers and stuff you know or if i'm fishing big crawdads i'm looking for big fish and, and i don't want to feed them a, a little tiny snack if if they're going to eat them a meal steak or something i might add to that you know, I think when people think about, I mean, think about a smallmouth river, it's just like any other river, but generally a little bit more spread out, at least in my case, you know, looking at third and fourth order of rivers, you, know, you have a riffle, a run, and then a pool. And in a lot of, in a lot of cases, particularly on the rivers that I fish, you have long pools, long flats. And so when I think of nymph fishing, I think of fishing those riffles and runs, yeah. you know, and I'm not going to say, I, I, I would not say that those larger adult fish don't inhabit that kind of habitat. But generally speaking, I talk to my trout clients about this all the time. You know, you, you have to think about it sort of at the, the next trophic level from a trout. You know, most of your, if you're out fishing a trout stream for, you know, wild rainbows or brook trout, you know, those fish are eating a lot of insects, you know, macroinvertebrates, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, you know, we talk about fish and crayfish and, you know, bait fish streamers, those food sources for the smallmouth are eating a lot of the same things that the trout are when you're nymphing for them. So in much the same way that a big brown trout might orient itself to its food source of a smaller trout feeding on insects and a riffle, a larger adult smallmouth oftentimes orients itself relative to the food sources that are in those riffles feeding on smaller macroinvertebrates, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes total sense. 
And then they will sort of infiltrate those riffles and sit in pockets and stuff, but they're often in there to pick off bait fish and prey fish and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. That's an excellent way to look at it. A good correlation. Let's, let's we, we've kind of started hitting on bodies of water, so which is where we're headed next. So water types are important to being successful, and, and I get that. And I think I sometimes get kind of dialed into two or three different water types that I really spend time on, and some I just blow through. But big bodies of water and small bodies of water, uh, big rivers, small streams, often have similar characteristics, although the bigger rivers have sometimes bigger types of that riffles, runs, and pools, while a smaller stream might also have riffles, runs, and pools, but they just might be, they would just be smaller. David, what types of water do you normally seek out and why do you seek them? Why do you go to those types of water? It's a good question. So I'll kind of divide this into two things. So the plateau streams tend to be a lot more like a mountain stream and we tend to have the exact water types that you're talking about, but it tends to be um, more rocky, more kind of pocket water in between those deep holes, interspersed with some really deep plunge pools, even that would be, you know, big white water features if you're out there paddling in the middle of the winter when it's, you know, 2000 cubic feet per second or something. So I'll, I'll kind of address, address that. And I would say that um, that's kind of separate from, say, some of those more lowland but still semi smaller streams like, you know, a little river, the little pigeon over in Sevierville or the Highland Rim streams over towards Nashville. So here on the plateau, those the smallmouth are found throughout. I've I've caught fish from really skinny pocket water all the way up to all those big pools. But I think it goes goes without saying that as an angler, we're always looking for that superlative. We're looking for that big fish. And the big fish here on the plateau at least are almost always going to be oriented in some form or fashion near deep water, one of those big holes. And it's mostly just a safety thing because these creeks do get so skinny. There's, you know, places where, you know, I can get across a stream that right now is probably at 800 or a thousand CFS, but come July, I could probably walk across without getting my feet wet. You know, those fish aren't going to be in that, that skinny water that time of year, just from a safety perspective, you know, nothing else. And so one of the really good piece of advice I heard somebody articulate one time, and they, they basically said, find the big white water features and you'll find big smallmouth. And it really kind of does come down to that. If you can find the holes and the big pools, the structure that creates those big white water features actually ends up being a really good smallmouth structure also on, on these, these plateau creeks. Hard to fish. I mean, hard to get around in there, even in the summer, because we're talking about boulders, some of them probably the size of my house, a lot of them the size of my car and my truck. Um, or my boat, you know, so really rugged, but the fish, the fish really like that structure. And again, safety thing. I mean, they're, you know, worried about aerial predators and stuff more than anything when you get that low water. So definitely deep holes when it's low water, but, but that said, going back to the different water types, I would say, you know, I was alluding to fishing in the cooler months when that water temperature maybe spikes up just a little bit, when the flows are up a little bit, those fish will move throughout the stream as long as they feel safe. And so those big, those big runs that might be down to a trickle in the summer. Those are awesome, awesome early season the holders of, of smallmouth. They'll be fished in, in all those big runs that'll take a bait fish pattern just, you know, like it's candy. This like probably right now. In fact, if, if the water's not too high, I could probably go out tomorrow and, and find some smallmouth that'll just crush a bait fish pattern. And if I went back four months from now, there probably wouldn't be a smallmouth anywhere close to that spot just because it's too skinny. You know, they're they're opportunistic just the same as you know your trout or anything. So they're going to be where the food is. And that said, like even when those fish this time of year are up in some of those runs and, or, or flats that might be too skinny later in the year, it still kind of makes sense. Like if you know where the deep holes are, you can say, oh, these fish moved up from that hole. That hole might be 150 yards downstream, but like, I know why these fish are here. It's because there's a giant pool just downstream. So a lot of these plateau creeks, if, if people are looking to fish these types of creeks, they in the summer might have, you know, a pool that's the length of a football field or longer, huge, huge, huge pools. And then they might have a quarter mile of riffle water that just holds a few scattered fish. It's not that they're fishless. There's still some fish in that water, but not a lot of fish. And so this time of year, when it's not as obvious, you know, where those shallower holes are or or shallower sections, you're like, man, I'm not catching too many fish. And all of a sudden you start picking up fish. Well, if you go back in the summer, you realize, Hey, I was within hundred yards of that giant pool. And those fish have kind of spread out to feed a little bit, but they're still close to home. They're, they're not, 
you know, just randomly out there cruising around for no reason. It doesn't take them long to get back to that pool either if if, if they need to. No, and, and they have to. I mean, these, these creeks in the plateau are kind of like a smoky mountain stream in the summer. They spike up and down so fast that those fish have to know their routes and have to be able to get back and forth or they're going to get stranded, you know? Right, right. And I will say the nice thing about fishing on these creeks on the plateau is the, is the water does get really clear and I'm sight fishing as much as anything. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm walking flats that might not be more than knee to waist deep at the, at the deepest point for, you know, 50 yards maybe. And you, you can see the fish. I mean, they're, they're, they're not hard to find. You look out in the middle and you'll see a shadow cruising around. That's your fish, you know? So <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of fun looking for those fish and, you know, looking all water types, but grass beds are the other thing. And I think that's something that goes more with lowland rivers also. So we get some grass beds here on the plateau and on those lowland rivers, it's a crucial part of the equation. I, I think grass is always just, just an amazing place to look for fish. They, they'll crash meadows up against the grass. They'll go in the grass to look for, for, uh, you know, dragon or damselfly nymphs or all sorts of good stuff there in the grass. And then they know it. So Matt, um, so you're, you're looking at a little bit bigger water, bodies of water, a little bit bigger rivers fishing from a boat. Let's, uh, what types of waters do you find yourself seeking out? I think like David did, I kind of have to take that in two directions because I do have, I, I counted it up before I did some presentation recently. And I think I have conservatively like 350 miles of river that I can float um, within like an hour and a half of my house. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Five or six different rivers and they're all different. I have, I have uh, dam controlled tailwaters that are, you know, TVA water bodies. So they have like two settings or, or three settings. I have, you know, freestone rivers. I have tailwaters that are more run of the river, but they have a lake in the middle. So they don't dirty up quite as much. And I have a lake. I have a couple of really small rivers. So in that sense, you know, day to day, um, what I'm seeking out is is just going to be, you know, the question I ask myself is what qualities do these individual fisheries have that will just be sort of positive percentage points for me any given day? You know, it's like if we just had three inches of rain, I can go fish under a dam um, and not have to worry about dirty water so much. But we'll probably have high flows because the water just cut on. And whereas it's normally really wide and flat and the fish can be anywhere in the summertime when the water comes on, they're tight to the bank. and They're a lot easier to target. Or, you know, it's like that this time of year, the small rivers, tributaries and second, third order rivers that are shallow, they warm up a lot faster than, say, you know, the big new river that's running 5,000 cubic feet and comes out of the mountains and all the tributaries of trout streams. So in that sense, I look at those different aspects to see, you know, which ones will work for me in different times of the year. And then within those rivers, again, I mean, I hate to, I hate to default to this, but it's always going to depend on time of year. And that's when knowing your river is really important. You know, this time of year, the fish are pulling out of big wintering holes and they're starting to move towards spawning habitat. So you know, I might be, if I had to pick a float for tomorrow, I'd probably pick a float that has two or three big, deep, slow, structure-filled pools um, that are broken up in between. And we can fish sort of the upper and lower extents of those where those fish are kind of, you know, bleeding out on their, their migration. Um, if it's the middle of April, I'm going to look for sections of river that are really they have lots of spawning habitat that have big wedge systems in them or have, you know, a couple of big slack, you know, inside bends with rocky structure on the bottom, you know, stuff like that. Dead as summer. That's another pattern. You know, usually for us, it's like end of July when we have our peak water temperatures. Right. We also have sort of our, our dissolved oxygen content has bottomed out. And so most, it, you know, if you have, again, like a riffle run pool, most of your fish are going to be in the upper parts of those pools and in the runs because that's where the uh, the oxygen is. Um, and that lasts for a couple of weeks. And then, you know, later in the summer, 
we're sort of under normal average stream flow conditions, you know, for efficient top water flies and the fish are just diffused throughout the whole river. You know, I'm generally going to look for pieces of water that have depth, not super duper deep, but sufficient depth with wood, rock structure, overhanging trees, et cetera. Um, but that still has a decent amount of current, sort of like walking speed water, um, where those fish can still have food coming to them, but they don't have to work their butts off in 85 degree water to to maintain a lifestyle. So those are the kinds of things that I I generally look for. I think uh, Joey Monleone, I, I don't, he's a local angler that has a TV show. I, we interviewed, we did, we it was really the the first day that I talked to him. We talked for about an hour. Uh, and then we came back a couple of days later and did the recording and something that y'all both have hit on here and David specifically. And then Matt, you hit on it as well as these, these fish, you know, they're looking for, for four or five things, some cover, some oxygen, some food, uh, you know, in a way to get away to safety, you know, to those deep holes and to those, you know, those different types of cover where they feel a little safer from predators. A lot of times it's going to be either otters or something like that, which I don't know that they ever get away from those, but you know, uh, birds of prey is another thing that they kind of have, they've got to be aware of. So I guess I'm saying this, that there's a whole other piece of that story in that episode. It's called uh, why fish do what fish do. And, and Joey's perspective on it mirrors y'all's in a lot of ways. So just a little bit more, information on that for somebody that might be listening that wants to dig a little deeper, you know, like I said, for to help their own program out. So Matt, you kind of started hitting on the different seasons a little bit. So I want to, I want to move into that since we're kind of headed toward that vein anyway, like anything, timing is critical. David, you hit on winter. Uh, so I think, I don't think I want to hit on winter too much. I want to hit on spring, summer, and fall, though. What are some presentation techniques for those different seasons? Uh, and what times of day are best for those seasons? So let's start with Matt, and then, David, I'll bring you in on the back end of this one. That's a, that's a good question. Um, and I would say sort of as an umbrella statement, given sort of stable weather and no you know, crazy – sort of atypical fluctuations in temperature throughout a given day. I am a, I'm a firm believer that smallmouth are, I'll say this, if I get on the river before nine o'clock or eight 30, any time of year, it's pretty, it's pretty rare. And that's all accentuated in the shoulder seasons, you know, spring, I usually, you know, we're skewing towards that high water temperature, you know, high metabolism time of day. Uh, which is generally, you know, 10 to four o'clock. So if it's March, April, I'm usually starting at nine, nine thirty, maybe even 10 and fishing until dark. But even in the summertime, you know, smallmouth are able to handle pretty high water temperatures. The way metabolism works, you know, they get not necessarily more active, but they have to feed more the warmer the water gets. So it might surprise people for me to say this, but generally speaking, even in the heat of the summertime, the majority of the big fish that end up in my boat happen in the middle of the day, you know, after 10 o'clock usually. A lot of that also is because of the way I fish top water the majority of the time, which is fairly passively you know, splatting bugs down and dead drifting them like dry flies and, and waiting for fish to come up and sip them rather than actively popping and, and working to fly really hard, which, you know, you hear people talk a lot about topwater smallmouth fishing and how it's an early and late kind of thing. And I, I would agree with that if we're talking, you know, imitating bait fish and frogs and stuff like that which you are, you know, when you're aggressively moving a topwater imitation. And I think that is because, you know, in the dead of summer, before the sun comes up and after it's gone down, you get those windows of sort of lower water temperature. So those fish are free metabolically to go out and chase a lot more and be a lot more active rather than when the sun's on the water and the water temperature is, you know, 80, 85 degrees and it's kind of peaked out for the day. So generally speaking, I would, I lean later in the day than maybe others. Yeah. Then, then in terms of, of 
time of year is that you, what you're asking, David? Like yeah, spring, summer, and fall, uh, and the different techniques. So you're you're get, you're hitting on it. Spring is is a huge gradient, and like we're seeing right now, um, it can it it can take three steps forward and two steps back, and four forward and five back. It just you know you're just working the water temperature and the weather all the time. But generally speaking, I would consider spring to start at probably about 48 degrees in water temperature. You know, once things have started to warm up a little bit, usually in the early March time frame. And uh, again, those fish are coming out of winter. And for the next 12 degrees or month and a half or so, they're going to be moving towards spawning habitat. And in some rivers, those areas are not very far apart. And in some rivers, they're seven, eight miles apart. So again, springtime, you really have to know the river, know where the winter habitat is, know where the spring habitat is, and then just sort of work the gradient in between those, those areas as things progress. But starting out, um, it's going to be slow fishing, you know, fishing crayfish and sort of bottom bouncing dredging flies close to the bottom. And that's when I use, like I was talking about earlier, that crayfish floating line kind of technique a lot up to, I'm not going to say it's a specific, you know, science, but somewhere in the low to mid fifties, there seems to be a switch where now all of a sudden that fish is warm enough to be active enough to chase down a fly. Now are you talking 50 degree water temperature or air temperature? Water temperature. So probably around 53, 54, 55 degrees, all of a sudden, you know, you'll be able to get them to chase something and eat it, you know, versus having to take it down to them. Yeah. So in that time frame, you know, now all of a sudden we might be switching to intermediate lines to fish a fly like that Murdoch minnow or like a Zuku, or, or you could fish a floating line with a fly that's got a little bit of weight in it. And then, uh, yeah, you're just following those fish to, to spawning areas. And then after that happens without getting, you know, too into depth about spawning behavior, you know, what happens is the males will move in first, sweep a nest, um, females come in, drop eggs, they get fertilized, and then the females are post-spawn immediately after that. And they kind of diffuse into the river from their spawning habitat, and they start to recover. The males sit on the nest and they guard for two, three weeks. And that post-spawn time frame, and again, it's a gradient, you know, not all fish spawn at the same time, so they go through waves. So you know, right after the spawn, you have a small number of post-spawn fish and a lot of pre-spawn fish still, some males guarding, and then it just sort of progresses from there. But those big fish can get hard to, to pattern in the post-spawn period. And one of the patterns that I've noticed on my rivers is the uh, fact that we have a lot of non-game sort of bait fish species that also spawn in that time frame so may and june and what those fish do is they become very brightly colored and very oblivious to just about everything going on around them and those those food sources generally spawn in tail outs and in riffles so in late may early june all of a sudden you can start picking up big 19 plus inch post-spawn females and like eight inches of water in a riffle where you'd never see them any other time of the year or in tail outs on the sort of upstream side of a ledge right before the next pool starts. That's what happens then for me. Then we get into summer, you know, it's usually right about the calendar start of summer, you know, end of June, those fish spawning's completely in the rear view. They're recovered. And they just diffuse throughout the whole river and they're thinking about feeding and conserving energy and growing as much as they can. So that time of year, they're spread out everywhere in good habitat. And, you know, that's when we're doing a lot of top water fishing, especially on sunny, bright, warm days. Of course, things change. You know, you get rainstorms, the water dirties up, comes up. Sometimes you got to go to streamers or fish closer to the bottom. But summer is kind of what people think about you know, in terms of smallmouth fishing where you can float down the river and cast it bank and, and catch fish on a lot of different. And then one of the really fun and interesting things for me in the summer, being a person that's out every day is, is the fact that, you know, over the years you have these interactions with these big dominant, you know, old fish and they tend to, you know, once they've spawned, they tend to go back to their same 
summer haunts year to year. And so you can kind of watch these fish grow up and you can keep a mental map of the river and have these big fish spots come, you know, July, August, September, but you can hit day to day. And now all of a sudden the question is like, when do we need to be there to try to get this big fish to eat? Cause he's just getting smarter and smarter every year. And I, I mentioned that because generally at the end of September, it's usually for me right around the end of September, early October, we get some cold front. Sometimes it's a hurricane um, and the temperature drops 10 degrees or something like that. Air temperature on average for a couple of days and the water temperature drops. And the summer pattern just totally dies and those fish leave and they're not there anymore. And they start to pack up into what I call wolf packs because now all of a sudden you'll float down the river and not see anything for an hour and then you throw your fly out and here comes like 12 fish that are <laughs> 13 to 20 inches chasing your fly down yeah and what they're doing is they're just you know they're just feeding heavily as they're transitioning in reverse to what they were doing in the spring back towards winter and you know of course it's not a couple week thing it's a probably most of the months of October and November that they're kind of on that, that transition. So that time of year, we're just kind of walking back, you know, we're doing a lot more streamer fishing. And then as things cool down, uh, dropping it just even further down in the water column and fishing crayfish and, you know, jiggy dredging kind of flies. Wow. That was a lot of good information right there. That'll be, that'll be worth a rewind and re-listen to going through those seasons. Like we just, well, like we just didn't like we're fixing to do with David. There's a lot of information that's going to be packed in there. So like I said, it may be worth scrolling back after, uh, after you listen to the whole episode and then picking some of those different seasons to part apart, depending on when you're listening to this and when you're chasing those fish. So David, uh, let's do the same thing. And let's go spring, summer, fall, uh, and also what times of day are best. But let's let's hit on those different techniques that you use, and hints for the if hints for those different seasons. I'm gonna more than anything hone in on the on the summer um, simply because that's when I do most of my smallmouth fishing, and I'll I'll give a good reason why. I will say it was kind of fun listening to Matt's explanation. It's kind of inspirational, it makes me want to go hit. <laughs> a broader variety of smallmouth waters than just my creeks here on the plateau because I'm a little limited up here and uh, it's kind of fun being able to pattern those fish throughout the different transitions they go through. That's pretty cool. Here on the plateau, I'm I'm pretty limited to the heat of summer most of the time simply because these streams are so rugged. You're not going to wade the banks on these streams if it's at all warm enough that critters can be out and about like snakes, I, you, you <laughs> won't find me staying on the banks. And if I can't get in the creek bed and stay in the creek bed, I'm pretty much not fishing these streams. So I'm I'm a little bit limited on, on my seasons. Now, I will say most years um, we at least get a window sometimes starting usually in April where it maybe doesn't doesn't rain for two weeks and our streams will get all the way down to, you know, 50 or hundred CFS or something before we get another front that pushes more rain through. And, uh, so usually I'll, I'll, I'll get my first smallmouth trip in sometime in April into May. And it, it's kind of the same thing where those early seasons we're starting out more streamer fishing, getting those flies deeper in the water column in short, just, you know, kind of that, but really the majority of my smallmouth fishing is that heat of the summer where we can get in the stream bed, stay in the stream bed, avoid the the ticks and the chiggers and the snakes and <laughs> all the other goodies up there on the banks that are out crawling around looking for us. Um, it's a real similar thing as far as my favorite thing I've, I've already, I've already said this about smallmouth fishing is, is fishing on the surface. And I do a lot of kind of what Matt was talking about where, you know, I fish a lot of stealth bombers or poppers, but not as actively as what probably a lot of people envision when they do that. We'll definitely chug them um, or give a big strip to get that bubble trail with the stealth bomber. But when I first make my cast, like I might leave it sitting there for 30 seconds or a minute before I do that first pop or that first chug. And a lot of times I give that first pop or first chug and I'll wait another 20 or 30 seconds. And it's usually after it's been sitting there for 20 seconds when the when that big fish comes up and sips it. And it's kind of fun because you think of bass and, and you're thinking of that classic toilet bowl of a, of a large mouth eating a, a frog <laughs> by the lily pads or something. And that's just, you know, I've had I've had plenty of smallmouth crush, crush a popper or crush a, a stealth bomber, but I've had way more come up and sip it just like a, you know, a trout on the clinch sipping a sulfur mayfly in, in early June or something. And 
it's just the coolest thing to have a fish that size sipping a bug that large like you would you know you, it's just so counterintuitive you think oh they got to get there just just kill that thing no they don't they just take as much time as little energy as they have to they, they got big by not having to expend that energy you know by making the most of the calories that they get and not wasting those calories so they're just very deliberate in everything that they do and uh fish a lot of that that top water stuff there in the heat of summer but also i still fish a lot of the you know crowd ads like i mentioned tequilas earlier and those could be classified as so many different things, but I'm convinced that the way we fish them up here, they're taking them as crawdads. There's really the way we're fishing them and the way we're, we're, we're bouncing them off the bottom and stuff. I don't, I don't think there's any reason that just a, that a regular crawdad wouldn't do the same. I just partial to that fly. I just think it's a, a fun fly to tie. I like tying them. Me too. I like that fly. They're just, they're just kind of fun. So I pretty much April, May, and usually here on the plateau, the first half of June, um, when I go start fishing as much as I'd love to tie a top water fly on, I'm tying on a, a, a clouser. If the water's still fairly good flow and fairly good for up here, I, I'm not going to wait any of these creeks much over probably 150 maybe cubic feet per second it's just they're just too rugged they're really really hard to get around i'm i'm a really strong aggressive wader on on streams and i will occasionally take a waiting staff here on the plateau on those bigger flows just because there's big sandstone boulders and you're stepping off into a hole and you may step as a hole that's a two foot in diameter between two little boulders and it it looks like it's a foot deeper and it's you know four foot down to the bottom of that thing so you know i'm fishing fishing streamers um and Fishing them initially as aggressively as I can, I'd much rather fish a streamer with a lot of, you know, either a jerk strip or a really hard strip as, as fast as I can. But as often as not, that's really not the retrieve they want. I fish a lot of streamers upstream in the current and then tumbling back down and stripping it just fast enough where I can jig it with my rod tip and strip enough to keep the line coming back to me. So I'm more or less tied to the fly. You know, a lot of just kind of wounded bait fish disoriented in the current type approaches i guess you could you could think of that as um, and then the other one that i really like is is an across or a down and across swing slash strip and again it's it's a slower way to present the fly um, when you're you're kind of swinging it in the current it's not it's not just ripping it through there because again as much as i like to start that way it usually takes about 10 minutes of ripping a fly to get a zero response and saying okay i gotta slow this thing down match the speed of the bait match the speed of the fish you know it's the water's still on the cooler end and and they may or may not be willing to chase super super hot they'll, they'll get out and move but they're not going to just you know blast 90 miles an hour across the pool now in the heat of the summer you throw a big popper out leave it for 30 seconds and you look way across the other side of the pool and there might be a fish coming from 40 feet away <laughs> and, and it's flying i mean it's, it's coming full speed the whole way and it gets right up to the fly and it just stops and you're like what are you doing <laughs> and it'll it'll stay stopped it'll just sit there and stare and sometimes it'll go ahead and eat a lot of times they'll start to turn away. They're just not sure about it. And that's the moment that you got to twitch it. And it's, it's really nerve wracking because if you twitch too much or too little, the fish is done. It's completely freaked out. I mean, you got to get just the right twitch and every day that twitch is different, you know? So sometimes you got to blow a couple fish before you figure out which twitch <laughs> is, is the right twitch for that day. But seeing those fish come flying from a long ways, ways away. And that's the cool thing here on the plateau, you know, in a really hot summer, our streams will get up into the eighties Fahrenheit last summer. We had pretty good flows. I think we didn't really get much above the mid seventies most of the summer. So the water's not getting as hot as maybe some of the lowland rivers would. And that keeps those fish just a little bit more active, a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more willing to come running, but they're still cautious. So they'll come running and then they'll put the brakes on and think about it for a while. They're, the smallmouth are one of the most thinking fish. I mean, I, you just see the wheels turn and they come up and look at your fly and you're like, man, what are you thinking about? Just eat the thing, you know? Fall, so I, I'll fish smallmouth pretty much to the end of middle to end of September. And as soon as those streams start cooling down, I'm usually so busy with trout through October and November. I just don't even have time to chase smallmouth. So I can't really say a whole lot about it other than, then a lot of the smallmouth up here are doing the same thing. Like, like Matt was talking about, they, and the thing with our smallmouth, those wintering holes don't tend to be super far away. Cause you get those really deep plunges that might be pretty good sized holes fairly often on these creeks. So 
Um, it's more like a mountain stream and that the wintering hole may only be 50 yards away or hundred yards away. They're not having to migrate three miles back down the river or something. So they are going to definitely concentrate back up though, as it starts cooling down. One other thing he was talking about wolf packs of fish and it was kind of fun. I, I liked, I liked that description. It was interesting to me that talking about those bigger rivers that was happening in that transition back towards winter mode, because here on the plateau, in the summer, fish will do that. And they'll be doing it on the peripheral edges of those really big holes along weed lines. And there'll be a, a school of fish um, crashing bait against weed edges and stuff. Wow. And sometimes even into the weeds. I mean, there, there's really, 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 really thick weeds that you all of a sudden just see the weed tops just moving like crazy like, what's going on you know 10 feet back from open water and you start looking and there's some fish that's got back in there chasing you know whatever bait is back in there that particular day it's pretty fun to watch but um that can be a challenge in terms of trying to target specific fish when they are potted up like that you know if you get your cast just right you might get the biggest fish but if you mess up in the least there's you know five other fish really close by and one of the little guys is undoubtedly going to beat the big fish to the yeah. fly so it, it can be a challenge when they're potted up like that sneak in there and grab it it can definitely be distracting too i i've had probably a dozen different experiences with clients where something like that happened it, usually it's in the month of october um mm -hmm where and we're usually still top water fishing but where client slaps the bug out there and look we'll, you can't see any fish but then all of a sudden there's like eight of them around and there's yeah. you know the two <laughs> biggest ones are like jockeying at each other and like like doing circles around the fly and like you can yep. almost picture them like eyeing each other and sometimes the client gets so distracted that like the biggest fish just slams the fly and they just they're, they're just like mesmerized yeah and that's uh yep. <laughs> it's 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 pretty i you know it's easy to get frustrated in those situations but it just makes me excited that a fish can do that to a person yeah <laughs> that's again a great story for somebody to to be able to tell so i was fishing for trout the other day uh, the other day, it was probably been, I don't know, maybe a month ago and, and was fishing the edge of a pool. We probably caught four or five fish out of there. The first one was the biggest, the second one and the third one were, you know, close to the same. And then it got, they got progressively smaller. Uh, and you're talking about a wolf pack. And I think that's a great analogy. So do you think there's a hierarchy of how fish eat? So, you know, maybe like it was that day, biggest to smallest, or is it, do you think it's just whoever got there first or let's, let's talk about that. On these creeks on the plateau, I think it, it happens both ways and there's, and, it, and it's interesting and I'm always, you know, I'm always questioning which environmental factor, which, um, you know, food factor, what it, whatever it is that, that is affecting the fish that day is doing it. Cause it seems like there's certain days where the smallest fish is always the first one there. And then there's certain days where it's always the biggest fish and, and you'll see fish come flying and it's just like certain days, it's the big fish is getting there first, certain days, the little ones getting there first, but I'm, I'm probably giving fish too, too much credit for intelligence. I, I probably do that more often than I should. It's a good excuse when they don't eat what I think they should eat, you know, but right. The, absolutely. <laughs> the big fish here on the plateau a lot of times you can you can kind of tell when someone's maybe been fishing your stretch of water that you thought was your own you know secret smallmouth section because they'll come flying up and then they'll kind of sit back and, and you know they'll be like okay i'm gonna let junior over here try that out and if it works out <laughs> for him then if it comes along again i'm gonna eat it you know but if it doesn't work out for them, then I've, you know, I'm not the one that got hooked and you can kind of tell that there's been a little bit of pressure, not a lot of pressure, but because of how small these creeks are, it doesn't take a lot of pressure to get those fish wise, getting kind of wise. Then there's other days where I really think it's just the first fish that gets there. Cause I, you know, some of the holes here on the plateau, they're not deep, they're not big, but they'll hold, you know, five, six, seven small mouth ranging from, you know, a little tiny little six inch guy up to you, maybe the big fish is 16 or 18 inches and you'll throw something in the middle of that hole and fish will come from every direction. Just, you'll see shadows and it's literally just the first shadow. There's what eats it. And it's kind of like mountain trout, you know, up in the Smokies, there's not a lot of food. We always talk about how presentation is so important and it's, you know, it's because there's not a huge volume of food and the plateau's the same. There's not a 
a really high amount of food. There are not a ton of nutrients on these streams. So when food does fall in there, it's kind of, you know, eat and survive or be the last guy there and you're eventually going to die type of a, a decision these fish have to make. So <laughs> it's really just the first one there just inhales it and the rest of them, you know, so I'll, I'll hook a fish and the other five fish that were running start chasing him as I'm, I'm fighting this fish. Cause they're just like, what are you doing, dude? You know, what's going on with you? It, it, I think it really, you know, from day to day, it, it does vary. I think I've seen it go both ways with that. Matt, how about you? Do you think there's a hierarchy i've been sitting here thinking and listening to davis do you think there's a hierarchy i, I don't i'm not going to give you a real answer um but <laughs> and i'm not going to pretend to understand anything that i don't um i would say that at least in my mind it's probably more likely that such a thing exists in a smaller sort of more segmented river like like the ones you're describing david where mm-hmm. You know, you've got a pool and you've got a head and you've got a lip of that pool. And, and realistically, it's not a it's it's still an open system, but you might have your four fish in that pool that are working with each other. But I would say uh, seasonally, I, I think a lot of it and I, I go back to water temperature a lot, but I think a lot of it has to do with water temperature. Like David was talking about earlier, a big fish moving really slow on a topwater bug is super common. And topwater, particularly a slow topwater presentation, is also really effective on big fish in the dead of summer. I think to a large degree because the water temperature is so hot and that food source is not, you know, if a terrestrial insect falls in the water near a big fish and their number one priority is consuming calories without expending calories, then they know that they can just kind of tilt their pack fins and slide up to it and sip it in and go back down and not really have lost anything in the equation. So I think in the dead of summer, your smaller fish definitely have the ability to do a lot, to be a lot more active in their food acquisition. Mm -hmm. And so if you find yourself or if your fly finds itself in a competitive you know, situation for predation, that smaller fish, I think, in a hot river is generally going to be the first one to get there because that big fish has a lot of weight to maintain. Whereas on the other side of the equation, you know, you hear people talk a lot about like trophy season with smallmouth fishing is usually in cold water shoulder periods like March, April, and October, November. And I can tell you that I can fish the same fly on the same line in April and have a bigger average size than I can in June. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and you just don't see the smaller fish. So I think to a large degree in colder water, a bigger fish is more capable of that quick chasing kind of, kind of action. So I think it really just depends on the season. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, a smaller fish is in competition. I see it with muskies all the time. I mean, a small fish is like a bat out of hell usually. Um, yeah. Because in, in, in my justification for that is that they're competing with a lot of other bigger fish. And if they see something, they're going to eat it. Whereas a bigger fish has lived a lot longer and they're a little bit more cautious. And, and then again, on the flip side, you know, a bigger fish is, is theoretically dominant. So he's going to take what's his, right? So I don't know if there is an answer, but it certainly does fluctuate. This this question came out of the podcast group. And I, as I like to say, I noodled on that thing for probably a couple of days off and on. And uh, I'm like, I'm not sure there's a 100% answer there. Like David, I'll try to assign them an IQ, you know, whatever their, whatever I think their intelligence level is, which is probably very small until I don't catch something that I want to catch. And then it, it increases. So I really ended up there is like, you know, the closer you can get it to a bigger fish, probably the better, <laughs> shot, probably the better shot you got mm-hmm. at catching that bigger fish versus the smaller one. But so this is the last question. And we asked this question of all our guests. I guess I started doing this about six or eight episodes ago uh, because I'm, I'm afraid that there's that one nugget of information out there that our questions don't hit uh, that, that maybe you've prepared yourself to give or maybe somebody has told you something that really works works for you and you want to pass it along so i guess i'll I'll start with david going first uh and then matt if you'll follow and i've noticed that as we've gone on y'all are becoming more comfortable with each other so if you want to 
you know, poke and prod on a, on somebody's answer, feel free to do that. I'll cut that little piece out, or direction out, but. They just leave the poke and the prod in. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what's the one question we didn't ask that you believe would help our audience become a more productive smallmouth angler? Like I said, David, if you'll go first, uh, and Matt will follow, and then I'll I'll – I'll probably poke around on this one a bit too. Yeah. So when I was reading through this, I was like, man, what, what can I even come up with? And it hit me like the thing that I guess got me started fishing smallmouth effectively when I first started diverging a little bit out away from trout. Cause I, I'm like most people, you know, trout's what brought me into fly. I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people trout's what brought me into fly fishing. And it's, you know, been the last, I don't know, 15 years or something that I've messed around with things like, you know, smallies and stripers and musky and different other things that out that are out there. And early on, when I first started thinking about smallmouth, Daniel Drake over at Little River Outfitters made a comment that stuck with me forever. And he said that smallmouth are a lot like brown trout. He said, just fish for smallmouth in ways like you would fish for a brown trout and and you'll start catching fish and the interesting thing about that that helped me as much with my smallmouth as it also did with my brown trout fishing um it took both of those things to a whole new level for me when i started thinking of them in similar ways and they're definitely different fish there's there's you know there's a lot of similar there's a lot of differences too but i think that you know just kind of that that big bad um often apex predator or or one of the apex predators in their system that's able to eat when it wants to eat and rest when it wants to rest and, you know, be a bully when it wants to be a bully. When you start thinking of it that way, similar types of water, um, slower water structure is important with both of those fish. Just thinking of them in that light has just made a, a world of difference for me for both of those species. It's, you know, things that I've taken from smallmouth fishing and applied to browns has made some interesting interesting changes in how I approach browns and then things that I do with browns that I do for, do a smallmouth help me catch smallmouth. So if someone out there is, is currently a trout angler and thinking about starting to get into smallmouth, kind of think of them like a brown trout and see what that'll do for you. That's a, I think that there, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. You, um, I, yeah, when I was looking at that earlier, the one thing, and honestly, I feel like we've hit it pretty good is uh, just this concept of understanding. Well, one, like I think we've demonstrated pretty well is that all, all fisheries are different, you know, smallmouth and have a wide range of, of habitat types. And it's really easy to read information, watch videos, listen to podcasts, et cetera, and think all I have to do is do what that guy's doing. And I'm going to catch fish <laughs> in my river. And that's not always the case because you might fish a small sort of the lower part of a high gradient sort of high elevation river, or you might fish a lake or a, a delta or, a, you know, a fourth order river, you know. So I think if it the biggest thing that anybody can do for any fish, period, um, but specifically smallmouth, is just understand how the fish progress through their year and just just understand them biologically you know look at what they eat where they are certain times of the year and what they need and then just you know plug that into whatever you're fishing and i think we hit that pretty good with the seasons but you know i grew up on a river uh the james river in central virginia where there there are whole floats like six seven miles of water that you just don't want to be on in the spring because there's hardly any fish there Unless, unless you have the background of understanding to know that, well, this is what they need for their, whatever their life history event is in the month of April, you know, you might just think that you suck at fishing or there's no fish in there, you know, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've got one of those here. Yeah. Make you think that you, you need to take, pick up a spinning rod or something. And that may not even help then. I mean, there's a, a lot of times a higher degree of, of, uh, possibility to catch a fish with a spinning rod and you know something will make some noise or or twitch a little different or move a little different but a lot of times there just isn't a fish right there period a stick of dynamite wouldn't wouldn't bring one out i don't know i have i have what is probably a bad uh trait and that i'm willing to just grind really hard 
sometimes. <laughs> and uh, there's a fine line between, I mean, like with the, with, with the musky thing in particular, or any of the big apex predators, it's like, at what point are you just not doing what you need to do to catch a fish, mm-hmm. you know, or, or, or is it just that, well, they're, they're dumb muskies and they're not eat, you know, what's, mm-hmm. what's the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, certainly I think in all fish and you need to have a little bit of confidence that you might know what's going on. And if you haven't caught a fish in two floats, maybe you need to look somewhere else. Yeah. We've got a musky float that I've been on about three times and had several follows, a couple of eats and no fish to the net. And you know, your confidence is low, but you know, they're at least, you know, they're there, you know, you'll get, but still it's just like everything hasn't lined up for the angler and you're just sitting in the rowers bench going, Oh, please, please do something, you know? But yeah. And, and when, when we, there's a, there is a fine line between grinding it out and yes. eating the move. Absolutely. You know, there just, mm-hmm. there really is. And, and man, that's a, if we knew the answer to that, you be wealthy, man. You I can make so be, much money. <laughs> I think so. I really think you could. I think you yeah. would have so much business. You know, you know. On the other hand, though, that's what keeps it interesting. If it if it got if it got too easy, it'd be a point where it wouldn't even be fun anymore. You know, it's got right. to be at least a little bit of work to it, a little bit. You know, of knowing your waters, learning learning what the fish are doing. Yeah, so, and I I that's something that I mean, David, you're saying you're a trout guy first, and a in a other species guys second i'm the opposite and so i come at everything from a smallmouth perspective and it frustrates me to no end to hear guys like i exist right 25 minutes from the south Folsom river and i hear guys Mm -hmm. say all the time it's like oh smallmouth they eat anything and they're just you know you can catch them all day long every day and it's like (laughs) (laughs) some days man i wish i could have you sitting in the front of my boat so i could oh man no kidding you know you know it's funny too it's about the time i think i have smallmouth figured out i usually run into one of those days and it's just like you know yeah i think you're right there's a lot of a lot of folks that are like the small mouth you can just get in front of them and, and there are days like that you put it somewhere close to them and they eat and you know you go home a hero there are other days that they're just not going to do anything for you it's just not your turn whatever and that's the day that you wish you had that person in front of the boat because a if they're not real if they're hung on that theory and they don't catch something well they've learned something the other side of that coin is if they're that dang good i want them in there so i can you right. know, bring something <laughs> bring yeah, something to exactly. the head so there's a couple of different ways to look at that one. Gosh, guys, this is there is so much information in here between you two. And I'm glad I kept my mouth shut for the most part because I feel like I would have just dredged up what I had put in that other episode that we put out in December. So it was just one one good comment, one good technique, one good piece of information out of a, uh, after the other between you two. And, and y'all worked well together. I like that. We We may... We may come back and complain about musky one day on an episode all together. So good job, guys. Really good job. But for the listener, if you find value in the podcast, share this episode and the podcast in general with your friends. Drop by the Southeastern floor and explore the merch that pays for the Southeastern Fly podcast. Remember, we've got some coaching sessions time still available. Uh, and one, one or two are fixing to come up. Uh, as people roll on and off the program. So who are our guests today on this Wisdom from the Guides episode? Our first grew up, first guest grew up in fishing and hunting the Blue Ridge Mountains and Roland Piedmont of his native, native Central Virginia. He fished the eastern United States at length. Currently, he guides in southwest Virginia and northeast Tennessee. You can find him at mattreillyflyfishing.com. Matt, man, I appreciate you stopping by and uh, and thank you for being a guest on this episode. It was really, really good to meet you and talk with you. That was a good time. Thank you. Our second guest grew up in Middle Tennessee and East East Tennessee, so kind of the kind of the line there between Middle and East Tennessee. He fishes all altitudes of Tennessee. He's very knowledgeable about fishing the West. He currently guides in Middle Tennessee, East Tennessee, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and the small streams, as you heard, of the Cumberland Plateau. You can find him at TroutZoneAnglers.com. David Knapp, thank you for coming back to the show. Thanks for having me. Always a good time. Excellent job, too. Totally different perspective from the small stream. Well, you just listened to a Wisdom from the Guides episode on Southeastern Fly. See you next time.
let's welcome back to the wit. Let's welcome back. Welcome back, Cotter. Let's welcome back, Cotter. Can y'all hear my text coming, text ding coming through? I mean, that people are. I can released a. An I can't episode. hear anything. We, you can't hear it either. We released an episode yesterday. Uh, yesterday about lunchtime, and I mean, it's going. Apparently, it's going well because I'm getting. I was hoping that I, I, it's coming through my headphones like ten levels higher than what any of us was talking. So, if uh, so, if you hear it, I apologize, but it must just be coming through my headphones. So. Yeah, I, I'm not kidding. That's gonna be that's gonna be a good one. I'll let y'all get out of here. I know we've all got a good early morning tomorrow. So yep. appreciate yep. it, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank all right. you. See ya. Talk to y'all later.